This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the NX Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the NX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shift channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red Tic Tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers, and in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. For those listening on KUNX and affiliates, I have two other shows each week that only air on my YouTube channel. Mysteries with the History is on Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. PST with my co-host Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio on KUNX. And each week we cover a different topic in depth. And on Fridays at 3 p.m. PST, the show Strange Paradigms is where I and a different guest co-host cover all the strange weekly news and mysterious headlines from around the world. So definitely check out my website at strangeparadigms.com for all show archives, more information, and direct video links to my channel. Also, make sure to hit the notification bell if you are watching this on YouTube. I have been getting comments by viewers that when they click the bell, they're not getting notifications. And then when they return to my channel, they realize that the bell has been turned off. And some have even stated that they have unsubscribed without their knowledge. So make sure that you are subscribed and getting the notifications. Covering some quick news today, would you allow cockroaches to run in your home for $2,000? Well, the pest informer said it's looking for five to seven households to release approximately 100 American cockroaches into their homes to test specific pest control techniques and gauge their effectiveness. The company provided a strict set of rules for the study, including that the trial period would last approximately 30 days. Participants must own the home or have written approval from the homeowner, be 21 years or older, and must be located in the continental United States. Ugh, my skin is just crawling thinking about it. Like, I'm not scared of bugs, but roaches, I can't. I, I can't stand them. Would you want 100 cockroaches in your home for 30 days for $2,000? I'm going to pass on that. 
With that out of the way, my guest today is Jim Harold. The Paranormal Podcast and Jim Harold's Campfire remain among the most popular in the genre. Collectively, his podcasts have been downloaded over 60 million times, and he's produced over 2,800 episodes. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Jim Harold. Jim, welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. How are you doing today? I am doing well, and it is such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show and looking forward to uh, chatting about the weird and the strange and the paranormal and and this wide world and, and, and mysterious world we live in. Well, let me just say, it is such a pleasure to receive you as a guest on my show. I mean, you're practically the original pioneer when it comes to podcasting about the many topics that kind of come under the umbrella of the term, the paranormal. And there's so many aspects of many mysteries that you cover on the Paranormal Podcast. But first, especially for my younger audience, or those that are new to the topics, let's start with how you got into all of this. So you started podcasting in about 2004, 2005, right when podcasting was still kind of a new thing. How did you get your foot in the door? Did you have anyone that inspired you at that time? Well, uh, I had been a big fan of talk radio and uh, growing up and also a fan of uh, the paranormal, going back to In Search of from Leonard Nimoy. And uh, and that goes back a lot of years. And uh, the thing was, is that I'd gone to school for broadcasting, but I didn't end up in front of the mic, but I did end up working in the media business and enjoyed that. But I was always a little frustrated. I never got behind the mic or in front of the camera like I'd kind of gone to school for so uh, 2005, I said, you know, I'm, I'm hearing these podcasts, people like Leo Laporte, the great tech journalist, who is still a very uh, big podcaster, who was really an inspiration. Adam Curry, who had been on MTV, he had uh, really co-invented uh, podcasting. And I said, well, maybe I'll start a podcast. And what could I do a podcast about? What would interest me. And I thought, you know, what interests me is the paranormal. I have a legitimate interest in this. And this is just something I'll do for fun. Uh, Lo and behold, um, you know, I dabbled for about three years and really got serious in 2008. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to put out a show in 2008 every week, every week I'm going to put one out. And with six months, I had my first sponsor, The audience kept growing and growing, and uh, that's how I get started. I really didn't have anybody to mentor me, per se. I just kind of figured it out as I I went along and got a lot of interesting guests uh, that I was very fortunate to get uh, early on. I think Lloyd Auerbach was my first guest uh, for the paranormal, and then my second guest was Stanton Friedman for UFOs. So I thought for my first two guests, I couldn't have done much better than that. So... uh, you know, it's just been a it's been a great journey. And I look back at those early days. And I had no idea this would become my full time career. This month will be 10 years full time. Well, first off, congratulations on 10 years. That is phenomenal. And and I feel like, again, as a pioneer, practically just going into the dark as a podcaster before I continue with a few other questions. Uh, For those that want to start podcasting, what are some basic things that need to be avoided or what are some things that you learned as you progress to become who you are today as a podcaster? Well, I think the important thing is before you start a podcast, make sure a couple of things that you're really committed, you know, doing a show and then doing another show in six months, that's not going to get you or three months or a month or is not necessarily going to get you any traction. So A, you know, just don't start a podcast from the standpoint of, oh, I want to start a podcast about anything. Find something you're really passionate about that you'll be able to work long hours on. There's so many resources out there now. So you have that advantage. The equipment is great and it's only getting better and it's relatively inexpensive. So I think commitment is the hard thing to really nail down to say, I'm going to do this every week or every other week without fail. I'm going to work at perfecting my craft. I'm going to work at becoming a better interviewer or a better storyteller or 
all of the 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 below and really say I'm going to make a major commitment. And if anybody has that kind of a commitment, I say go for it because uh, there's still, even though you know there's a lot more podcasts than there were in 2005, I still think there's a great opportunity uh, out there because I think what it turns out to be is. A situation where, you know, people say, well, there's so many paranormal shows. But if you decide to start a paranormal show today, the difference is you. That's the difference. There's only one you. So I I think that really does make a difference that everybody can have a unique voice. And whether you started in 2005 or 2023, you still can make an impact because there's only one you. As long as you have a legitimate interest and you're willing to put the time and work in. I couldn't agree more on that. And talking about the paranormal almost every day, like you said, you need to be pretty passionate about it. Did you have an experience as a child or any time before 2004 that inspired you to address this subject so publicly? Well, um, we, um, I've, and you might hear my dogs barking. It's not anything paranormal. I think somebody's delivering something. So I'm going to apologize in advance. <laughs> no need to ignore the elephant in the room. Uh, but the, and that's the dangers of recording from a home studio, even though it's sound treated, those dogs, it's no match for those dogs. Uh, but going back to the question, uh, did I have an experience before this? Uh, I had had uh, not so much myself. I'd had some weird happenstances, but my family had had experiences. Uh, my parents had a remarkable UFO story. Uh, my wife had uh, a remarkable vision of uh, Mary. Um, I had a weird kind of synchronicity with the passing of my brother in 1999. So yeah, there had been some familial uh, experiences. Now, I have never been one who has seen a a full-blown ghost in front of me, for example, who's just appeared, or I've not really seen what I would consider a totally inexplicable UFO, for example. But uh, like some people, you know, some people experience these things all the time. That's not necessarily me. But there had been enough that that was part of the fuel, I think. That was part of the fuel behind it. Can you share that story that one of your family members had during their UFO sighting? Oh, yes. Well, this goes back to um, the early 70s when I was a baby, uh, dating myself there, but it is what it is. And my parents had gone out and we were visiting my grandparents, which is were in, they were in West Virginia. So... Uh, Anyhow, they had gone out to this secluded area. I don't want to know why, uh, but they had gone out to the kind of this secluded area, and my dad and mom were sitting there in the car, and they said the whole sky lit up, the entire sky. And my dad said that it was enough that uh, actually you could read the speedometer, the speedometer on the uh, on the car. Uh, like somebody was shining a light on it. And this went on for, I don't don't know, 30, 60 seconds. Then he said he turned to his left and he saw a man with what he called a welding mask with his hand held up, okay? And then, and my my mom backed this. She didn't see the man with the welding mask, but she did see the very bright light in the sky. And then he said, we're getting out of here. And he hits on the gas and they're going down the road. And in the words of my mom with her accent, uh, she said, then Jimmy, we saw the biggest birds on the side of the hill that I've ever seen in my life. And the next day they fully expected to see something on the news. There was nothing. And I look back at that experience that I'd heard way before I had any knowledge of the UFO subject. And I think about all of the touchstones and all of the interesting things that they mentioned that you hear in other kind of alien encounters. My dad called it a man with a welding mask. Could have been an alien. My mom talked about the birds along the side of the road. Could that have been something like the owl encounters and the screen memories that Mike Clellan talks about? So my goodness, what a what a magnificent UFO experience. My dad's 86 today. He still is with us, thankfully. 
He tells exactly the same story. My mom unfortunately passed about nine years ago, but up until the time of her passing, she told the same story. Never changed. And this is before the X-Files and before In Search Of and before Unsolved Mysteries. They they told me this this story when I was knee-high to a grasshopper. You know, I was like five years old. So the thing is, is that... Um, that's such a great encounter. And I've shared that with some experts who have been on the show and they said, yeah, that's, that's a pretty neat uh, UFO encounter. It is. And I do like the fact that your parents shared that story with you. In many respects, parents don't really share their encounters with their children. So I think it's a pretty exciting experience that they were able to share that with you. And as an adult now, again, talking about the paranormal and the UFOs, I guess, every day, have you had more experiences since? Or do you have a keen eye when you go out? And what I'm getting at is, how has your podcast changed your view on day-to-day -day life? Well, I always was a believer in the supernatural. I always believed that there was something to all of this and something more to life than what we can measure in a test tube or weigh on a scale. I've always believed that. I believe it more now than I did in 2005. I am a total believer that there's something to the UFO phenomena. I am a believer that there is something to ghosts. I am a believer that there is something to the afterlife. The thing is, though, is that I don't know if I'm as certain about what those things were. If you talk to me in 2005 about UFOs, I'm like, yeah, sure, there's something going on. And it's definitely aliens. And now I feel like it could be aliens or it could be time travel travelers or it could be interdimensional travelers or a number of other things that we've not thought of. Same with ghosts. I would have thought, oh, ghosts are dead people. But, uh, but now I'm like, eh. Maybe not. Or maybe some of them are dead people. Maybe some of them are just residual hauntings, just replays. Uh, maybe some of it is kind of like a time slip. Maybe we're seeing a past time. I guess what I'm saying is the certainty is greater. The certainty, the certainty is greater that there's something going on, but the certainty of what it is, is much less. In terms of other experiences, I tend to have... Um, uh, uh, kind of synchronistic experiences. That's the thing, the kind of things I've uh, experienced in my life. And, and one of them happened a few years ago. I don't know if we have enough time for this full story. Uh, so let me know if we don't. But uh, this was on a paranormal cruise. This must have been four or five years ago. Um, I was on a cruise with Micah Hanks, who I know you know, and the late, great Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who was speaking on the cruise. I was speaking... And we were at an at sea day and uh, Micah was speaking and I was going to speak and Rosemary spoke. And it's kind of like once Rosemary spoke, I'm like, that's OK. I, I don't need to. She, you know, you know, she could be having an off day and be 10 times better than me. She was so good. Uh, the great uh, paranormal researcher and author, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. But uh, I was going to speak, but I had a cold. So. I thought before my session, I would go get some coffee from the cafe and you had to pass through the uh, cruise casino uh, to do that. And I was coming back to begin my talk. And one of the attendees that was in our group was playing this uh, machine in the casino. It was one of these big machines that had money in it and it has a claw that comes down and grabs the money or more likely than not, doesn't grab the money and takes your money. <laughs> so anyway, um, I had a thought when I saw that crane machine, I had an uncle who was like a second dad to me and he passed uh, a few years before this. And I said, oh, I had this very intense feeling. I wish he were here. He would love this so much because he used to always go into stores and use those crane machines to like try to get little toys, little stuffed animals and things. And, uh, so anyway, I, I had this big thought of him. I'm like, oh, I wish he were here. Not only would he love it, he'd love it because he'd be going for money rather than stuffed animals. And he probably wouldn't win a thing, but he'd just have such a good time. Man, I wish he were here. No sooner I thought that, Christina, than a woman walks up beside the machine and cups her hand to her mouth and goes, John, John. Guess what? My uncle's name was John. 
Now, this woman's, I guess, her spouse or person with her and the crews walked over and it was John. They become separated. But what were the chances I had this incredible thought of my uncle in the middle of the sea and this woman like screams out his name right when I'm thinking of it. To me, that's the universe or John himself saying, you're thinking of me. I'm going to return the favor and show you that uh, I'm still around on some level. And, and I think those synchronistic things happen a lot of times on my campfire show. We talk about that. And uh, th that was very meaningful to me. Now, it's not a traditional ghost story, but I do think it's something supernatural. That's a really beautiful story. And the, when you're dealing with synchronicities, it can be kind of invigorating, but also very confusing in many respects. And especially if you're not knowledgeable in it, it just makes it kind of like, oh, what a crazy coincidence. Right. But a little bit earlier, you mentioned about how your thoughts have changed about what UFOs are and what ghosts are. And I feel that the more research that we do, the more stories that we cover, we're able to have a broader spectrum of what to look for and how to accumulate our opinions and they can only be bigger and better with the more information that we have but for many people it's very limited based off of merely tv shows movies and maybe a few video games and of course when you're dealing with that with a limited amount of knowledge it's very difficult to decipher what's really going on and you've covered a lot of stories so um you said that ufos could be actual extraterrestrials they could be time travelers they they could be some else entirely and that's what i find so incredibly exciting about these types of fields is that every single day when we cover a new story or we cover um, when we look at more research our opinions are always changing our viewpoints are always changing and if we don't change what well, we're never going to grow we're never going to be that great researcher or that great podcaster or storyteller that we want to be now, you also mentioned well, this beautiful story happened on a cruise, and I did a show a few weeks a few weeks back on a cruise that was going through the Bermuda Triangle. Mm -hmm. And there was a list of speakers and a handful of people that are well known in the UFO community. And then I saw your name and I'm like, no way, that is so cool. So are you excited to be part of the cruise in 2023? And what's your opinion about the Bermuda Triangle? You know, what's really ironic about this is that as a kid, I was so fascinated by, and I'm talking like five, six years old, six years old, mainly. I was so fascinated by the Bermuda Triangle and this idea that, um, you know, there was this place that ships went in and they didn't come out. And... Uh, so I'm thrilled to be on it. I believe the URL, and we'll double check this, is ancientaliencruise.com, ancientaliencruise.com. I'll w double check that, but I believe that's the URL that Holiday Maker Travel is using for this. Uh, Mike and Wendy and the crew over there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to be on the cruise. It's going to be me. It's going to be Nick Pope, Micah Hanks, Peter Robbins. I couldn't be more pleased to be uh, on with that uh, that group in in that was the group I did the previous uh, cruise with that I was telling you about. And uh, as far as the Bermuda Triangle goes, and, and forgive me, I can't remember the, the flight number, but there was a training flight in the 40s that was lost in the Bermuda Triangle. I believe they were Navy av aviators, I believe. Um, not 100% sure of that. But uh, that was an amazing case because these... Ex the, the, you know, you had some people that were being trained, but you had some experienced pilots and they went into this area and the radio communications didn't make a lot of sense and they seemed to be confused. So who's to say that there isn't something going on in the Bermuda Triangle? Does that mean that each and every ship or boat that goes through there uh, is going to meet their demise? I don't think so, or else I wouldn't be going on a cruise uh, that, uh, that that's going to take an outing. Uh, to the triangle. Uh, on the other hand, uh, could there be something to it? And is there maybe something to it? In some cases, I think that's possible. I think that's possible. I mean, I haven't heard of any disappearances in that area for a while. But really, again, this was one of the, the, the ironic thing, again, is 
This was on my top five when I was a kid. I was so, because at that time, there was a guy named Charles Berlitz who was coming out with books. And there were a lot of TV specials and stuff about the Bermuda Triangle and the secrets of the Bermuda Triangle. So it's always fascinating. So it's a real kick to, to be able to be a part of that cruise. Well, I definitely look forward to you coming back from that cruise, okay? So don't That's get lost. The plan. That's <laughs> the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> well, Jim, we are coming towards a break. We will be right back. gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB BX This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks program right here on KUNX and right now you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez source for alternative talk radio on the internet the x howdy folks this is lou elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend christina gomez on shifting the paradigm do you have an interest in the paranormal then you'll love the unxnetwork.com the x is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural strange and mysterious like ufos bigfoot ghosts and so much more from hosts like jimmy church whitley streber micah hanks and christina gomez visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the x be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network. And you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm. paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez. Gomez. On, on the X. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. I'm gonna 
welcome back. With me today is my guest, Jim Harold, a podcast pioneer from the Paranormal Podcast Show. What blows my mind is that you have produced almost 3,000 episodes on your two main shows, being the Paranormal Podcast and Jim Harold's Campfire, which are among the top 1% most downloaded podcasts on the industry's largest podcast host, being Libsyn. So I'm asking you a tough question here, Jim. Which has been the most memorable episode for you? Well, first of all, just a slight correction. I've done, I'm approaching 3,000 episodes of all my shows, but that's everything all put together because I have a number of plus shows and other shows we do. So I just want to be fair and, and, and be honest about that. But still, a lot of shows. Um, to your question, um, boy, that is a tough one. Um, I would say the most memorable is a campfire story, specifically an episode that had a campfire story which has become my favorite all-time campfire story because my most popular show is Jim Harold's Campfire. Uh, the Paranormal Podcast, I interview experts and so forth on the paranormal. When I say paranormal, I mean it all. Ghosts, cryptid creatures, UFOs, a wide range. But uh, my most popular show, that show's popular, the Paranormal Podcast, but the most popular show is Jim Harold's Campfire. And there's one story that stands out above all the stories I've heard since that story, uh, show started uh, 13 years ago in 2009. Would you like me to share that story with you, Christina? Please. Well, it's called The Roadhouse Saloon. And I've told this a lot of times. <laughs> so I hope I get it right this time. Um, basically, this was a listener and she must have called in probably, I think, about 2011. So that's how long ago this has been. And she told the story of, uh, she's from Michigan, but she was visiting Wisconsin. She was staying at some kind of campground or something, and her and her family would go every year. This particular evening, she had gone with a friend to go see a band about a mile away. No, no an hour away. And they went to see the band, and they're both musicians, so they waited till they were done. So they left that place like 2.30 in the morning. Okay, so they had about an hour to drive back to the campground. And uh, it was a very rural area and everything was closed up tight. And T.I., that was her name, T.I., told her friend Bob, well, I've got to use the restroom. And, and he basically said, well, there are these bushes out here or, you know, you're going to have to wait because nothing's going to be open. She says, just drive fast. So they're driving along about a half hour. And lo and behold, there's this bar off to the side of the road. Neon was on. There were cars in the parking lot. The joint was jumping. And I'm like, hey, we're in luck. I don't know why this place would be open three o'clock in the morning because all the bars are supposed to be closed by two. But let's not look a gift horse in the mouth. They go in. T.I. goes to the the ladies room. Um, Bob gets, uh, I think, a couple beers from the bar. And they're talking and Bob says, I'm glad we really stopped here because Bob was an artist. And he said, there's this great mural on the uh, one whole side of the, the place. And it's in an old West motif. And uh, there's cowboys and what they used to call dancing girls and uh, some guys playing poker and a guy behind the, 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 the bar. And they started looking at it. They noticed something very odd, Christina. They noticed that all the people in the painting were physically there in the bar. The guys playing poker were playing pool. And, you know, there was a woman sitting over here, but she was in what they would call at the time a dancing girl outfit. So it was really weird. And they started talking and said, well, maybe it's just a coincidence. Or maybe, um, you know, the artist knew the regulars here, so they kind of made them models, kind of as a homage to them, a salute. And they're drinking their beer and they're talking. This one guy comes up to T.I. and smiles with a mouthful of rotten teeth, T.I. said. And he's put Chubby Checkers Let Twist Again on the jukebox, which is the old Woolitzer Bubbler jukebox with actual records in it. And he's playing it, and he asks T.I., do you want to dance? And T.I. holds up her cane and says, no, I, I don't do much dancing. And T.I. says, 
She's glad she had that cane to kind of beg off. <laughs> so nevertheless, um, they, they, they think, boy, this is just a weird place. Everybody's kind of like looking at them almost blankly and like smiling, but not like they're quite there. This strange guy comes up and wants to dance. The, the, the people on the mural, just, just kind of odd feel. So they notice there's a pair of double doors, kind of like you would have seen in the old West movies, you know, where the, 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 the criminal comes in and says, I want to see the sheriff, you know, getting ready for the showdown. But they notice something in those doors they didn't notice before. They notice two little columns of mist, one shorter, one's taller. And they start talking and said, I remember that there. And they talk some more and they look back and they're, they're shaping into a form like an old school Polaroid picture. And one's a woman and one's a man. That's odd. They keep talking. They look back. There's a tall man and a shorter woman. The woman has curly hair. T.I. has curly hair. The woman has boots on. T.I. has boots on. Well, a lot of people wear boots. A lot of people have curly hair. The woman in the mural, all of a sudden, they notice she has something else. She has a cane. And that's when Bob and T.I. say, that's too close to home. That looks just like us. Let's get out of here. They get up. They're going to the door. People are beckoning them back. Come back. Come back. They close the door. Everything goes dark. Like it was never open. Okay? Then they look out to the parking lot. There is a car. One car. Their car. They get in it and they go away. Now that alone would be a very wild story. But th there's more. Within a couple of days, T.I. goes with, I can't remember if it was her sister or a friend. And uh, they go back. T.I. is a lot braver than I am, Christina. So nevertheless, she goes in. She walks up to the bar. There's a young lady behind the bar bartending. And she says, you know, um, I was here the other day. There was this big, good-looking, young, strapping guy behind the bar and... You know, the, there are a lot of people, the place was jumping. She's like, I'm sorry, but the only people that bartend in this place are me and my elderly father. Well, T.I. thought, well, that's weird. Then she walks over to the jukebox, which is a different jukebox. It's not a classic Wurlitzer, and it doesn't play records. It plays CDs. And oh, by the way, there's no chubby checker or let's twist again on the jukebox. And with that, T.I. says, I've seen enough. The mural is still there. No more mists, though, in the doorway. She said, time to leave. And she leaves, and she never went back. And that's the story of the Roadhouse Saloon. So I think that is the most memorable campfire story we've had, which translates into our most memorable episode, maybe. The whole time you were telling the story, my eyebrows were like this. Like, <laughs> this could not get more strange, and it kept getting more yeah, strange. Yeah, it did. And the thing is, is I felt so strongly about that story. Is I traveled up to Michigan in 2019 pre-pandemic and actually met T.I. We've got a, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jim Harold. There's actually, um, that video was on there. I met her in person. She's, I don't want to get too personal, but she was in a very uh, respected position. Uh, I believe that she is retired now. And I sat down with her. I was at her home for probably four, four hours, I'd say. Looked her in the face. She told the same story, and I believe every word she said. That is so, oh my gosh. So let's say you were in her shoes and you were having this encounter. What would you do? I often say, and I mean it, I'm a coward. I'd be out of there faster than you can imagine. I would not go back. Not at all. 
T.I. sounds very brave to go back the very next day to say, like, what the heck is going on? I have yeah. to see it once yeah, again. I but was I like, you went back. You wouldn't catch me. And, and oh, oh, there's another thing I didn't even mention. The place is real. Chad Lewis, the great researcher, went there and took pictures. And actually, in that video, you will see pictures of the actual mural. The place is real. Now, I know it was open as recently as 2019. Now, with the pandemic, so many restaurants and bars have been hit so hard, I have no idea what's going on today with them. But as of 2019, they were open. I had tried to call them to see if I could, since I was coming up that way, or actually I would have gone there probably or at least done something like this. I wanted to interview somebody by the place because after we featured it, uh, the people over at Spooked, that very popular podcast, uh, actually I had referred them over to TI. So they're very well known in the podcast space. So I wanted to interview them, but uh, nobody returned my calls. So I don't know if they don't appreciate the, uh, the the publicity or they just were tired of hearing from it or they just nobody ever passed along the message. Point being, the place was real. And the mural was real. I've seen pictures of it and I've posted on my Facebook page and they're actually in that video. When you watch that video with T.I., you will see pictures of a painting and that is the actual painting. I think the scariest part about the story was when T.I. and her other were uh, becoming a part of the mural. I oh, think of course. Yeah. I think that had to be scarier than the stairs that you were demonstrating. I think being a part of a mural and like, what, are you going to be stuck there? forever yeah, i mean yeah. so many and, questions and that's the thing the nature of reality that's why i wonder about all of these things what is the nature of reality you know i kind of i have this picture of a, a library behind me Psst, everybody it's a green screen we're working on my studio but but the point being is i kind of liken reality to a library you know those big old mansions you see in movies and they have these huge, like, Downton Abbey-type libraries. I imagine us as, like, somebody that goes to visit that house, but the library door is closed and locked. But there's a little keyhole, and we're looking through that little keyhole, and we can see some volumes on the wall, and we kind of understand this is a library. But we don't know what's written on the books. We don't know how many books they are. We don't know the subjects of the books. And as I said, certainly not the words that are on them. I think we see that little of our reality. So when we make these guesses about the nature of reality, I think many times that's what they are because there's just so much more to it than we can grok. That's just my thought. I actually really like that analogy. I, I, I've never heard anything like that. And I think that kind of sums it up in a pretty good manner. So my next question would be, do you ever do boots on the ground investigations yourself or like go on camping trips to zones of high strangeness with your family? Because I'm aware that your daughter, Cassandra, now has her own podcast. So it shows that your work has rubbed off on your family. So have you and your family carried out paranormal investigations together? This is going to sound odd. And the answer is no. And that's by design. Um because I've thought about this long and hard. Should I be, am I not, uh, do I not have credibility because I don't go out and investigate or do UFO investigations or paranormal investigations or Bigfoot investigations, whatever it might be? Do I lack credibility? And here's the analogy that I would use. If you look at sports programming, okay, football, baseball, basketball, whatever it might be, soccer, uh, football, if you're in England, <laughs> real football, you have two kinds of announcers, two kinds of broadcasters. You have the person who played, very popular. You have a person who was maybe a great player, and then they graduate into the broadcast group, uh, booth. And I think those people have a great perspective. And then you have the professional broadcasters who have, you know, maybe they played in school or something, but they've never, they've not been pro athletes or anything like that. And I think you need both. And I think for this kind of media, I think there's a certain value to have somebody who is not too beholden to one viewpoint, not too beholden 
to one way of doing things or a certain kind of methodology or uh, UFOs are definitely this or ghosts are definitely that, that it's a good thing to have somebody that kind of serves that role of traditional broadcaster. And that's where I've decided to plant my flag. So maybe some people might say, well, that's a cop out. He just doesn't want to go on investigations. But I think there's a value from having things a little bit at an arm's length and looking at them this way rather than immersing yourself in them. Absolutely. Having that different perspective is necessary. If everyone was a field investigator, well, then you're not going to have that variety for those that actually read the books and do the research, right. Right. reading other people's encounters. So I think it's important to have both. And if you have one strength and one weakness, that's fine. And that's completely normal. Now, let's say you were an investigator doing boots on the ground investigations. Where what would be the first location you would go to to investigate, if you could? Actually, a place I've wanted to go to just as a lay person, just to experience it, and I've not gotten to go, which is kind of silly. It's not that far away. And it has an unfortunate name because it's what it was called back in the day, it was a Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, which is in Western West Virginia. Now, the ironic thing is that's about 35 miles from where my mom grew up, and we used to pass it every year. Now, Back in the day, people weren't very sensitive. So at that time, it was the state hospital. And there would always be a joke, oh, let's uh, uh, drop somebody off there because they need help. You know, and, and it was a little insensitive, uh, but uh, that was just the way things were back in the day. But uh, but we always said, there's the state hospital. That's where, you know, people that had these issues, they, they were at. And um, having not grown up by it, but been exposed to it, many times over the years to know that that's one of the top haunted locations in the United States. It's like, I really need to get there and just uh, do it more as uh, just for the experience. Not so much that I'm going to become an investigator because I don't, you know, going to one or two places doesn't make you an investigator, but it'd be nice to have the experience. Also the Mansfield, um, uh, Ohio, um, State Reformatory here in uh, Ohio. That would that would be interesting uh, as well because I, I am from Ohio. Can you talk about the Mansfield, o Ohio location? Well, I mean, it's notoriously haunted. Um, the The odd thing is, I don't have a lot of Ohio ghost stories. The weird thing about what we do, and I'm sure you find the same thing. I'm just as likely to have an Australian. Uh, story is I am an Ohio story. I remember one time I went on one of the local radio stations. I said, don't ask me about Cleveland ghost stories because I don't necessarily, because I'm from the Cleveland area, I won't necessarily have anything for you because I get them all over the world. Same with this. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I could probably tell you better stories about a dozen different locations just because, and that's the, the, the odd thing. I mean, I just, uh, the, the support we get from places like Australia and we're noticing an upswing up in Canada. We're getting more people. Um, so it, it, it's funny. It's actually kind of the odd thing when somebody recognizes you. I had an instance. I think it's a funny story for a content creator. I had a funny story uh, last year. I was uh, we moved in a new neighborhood and my wife and I for the first time went out to, uh, post pandemic or we're kind of still in the middle of it, but when things were settling down, the vaccines came out. We went out to have dinner at a steakhouse and we were sitting outside and somebody called my name and uh, it turned out, I thought they were calling my name for the table. It turned out to be a listener who recognized me, who lived in the area, which I was blown away by. Well, the, the kicker to the story it was the nicest thing because I have such nice listeners. We had our, I went to the bar. He was at the bar. I, I went and took a picture with him. We came back, had our dinner, and I said, well, can you bring the check? And somebody said, no, it's already taken care of. Your friend at the bar picked up the check, which I just thought <laughs> that was above and beyond. That was so nice. But the, the point being, it's a shocker when we get listeners in Ohio. I'm more likely to hear from somebody in the UK and Australia. So I'm sorry, I'm not a, a, I'm not a font of knowledge on Mansfield, uh, but it's a great location I'd like to check out more. My question would be, did he recognize your face or was it your voice that caught his attention? I think it was my face. I've done enough on YouTube and things, but I've had, I had that happen one time too. And this is early on. 
Uh, must have been at least 10 years ago, maybe more. Probably more, actually. Uh, I was at this, um, it was like an Italian food store. It's like a little specialty market. And we had ordered something. My wife's Italian and my family loves Italian food. So we ordered something for one of the kids events. And I'm talking to my friend and this guy whips around the corner and says, are you Jim Harold? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> guilty as charged. Oh, I listen to your show all the time. He recognized my voice. So it, it, it's rare. You know, I always joke. I call myself a micro celebrity and, uh, uh, you know, 99, you know, my neighbors probably think that guy doesn't even work. Although now a lot of people work remotely, but years before I'd never leave my house and probably people think he doesn't even work, but uh, it's an interesting way to make a living. And I'm extremely thankful for my listeners and, and everything they do for us. You worked from home before it was cool. You were already prepared for it. I was on <laughs> Zoom before it was cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a horrible thing that's that's happened to us uh, over the last few years, humanity. But thank God for the the technology we have and the ability um, to do what we do, like what we're doing right now. Now you you're a little young for this, but there used to be a very popular TV show in the '80s called Nightline. And they did it with a satellite and it was a two person interview and it was a big deal. And and now we can just do it from the convenience of our offices. And it's it's just such a such a neat thing. And that goes back to your point about content creators. It's uh, it's a great time to be doing this. All the technologies there are readily at hand. It is. And it makes life, I guess, to make a living more interesting than going to your typical nine to five job. So uh, what we're doing now, I guess, is almost a little too futuristic if we tell our grandparents something like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took the longest time to get, convince my dad I was I, I was doing something worthwhile for a living. But now he, he kind of gets it, kind of, sort of. But, uh, you know, it was kind of a tough slog to, to kind of get that point across. It's like, you know, I'm not just goofing off here. This is uh, something that has a following and means something to people. And that's really important to me, Christina. When I look at the, the campfire, for example, when I started in 2009, it was basically Jim Harold's campfire it was an offshoot of the Paranormal Podcast. I literally had a week I didn't have a guest. I said, well, what can I do? Maybe I'll just do listener stories. And my goodness, people loved it. And I said, well, I'm not the, the brightest guy, but this is a separate show. So I started, I thought it would be a fun little thing like telling stories around the campfire. And it has that component to it. But it, it seems to mean a lot to people to be able to have a place. And there's more and more of them all the time. But to have a place where they can go and they can tell a story and not be judged. And when people come on Jim Harold's campfire, what I try to do is give them a space where they can openly tell their story. I'm not going to laugh at them. I'm not going to pepper them with these kind of adversarial questions. I'll ask some questions, but I'm not going to say, are you sure? You know, um, and I think that's important for people more important than I realized when I started, it's kind of like one of those happy accidents. It's just something that, that really seems to resonate with people more so than I ever thought it would. Having that community and, and giving people that safe space, and that's in quotation marks, is incredibly important. People don't realize it until after you've actually seen the results of it. And I feel for a lot of people's podcasts, either if they're sharing other people's stories or if they're just having a conversation like this, it opens people's minds, it piques their curiosity, and it also opens them up to tell their own experiences as well. Now, we only have a few seconds left before we get into a break, so I'm going to ask this last question pretty quickly. If you lived in a haunted house, would you stay and like record all the evidence or would you flee? It depends on how intense it got. If it got where it was threatening, I might leave, especially if it was threatening my family. Of course, I'd leave, no question. But I try to stick with it a while and see what happens. So I, I, I that's kind of the ultimate cop out answer, but I, I give it a chance. And it's, I would probably do the same. Jim, we are coming towards another break. Viewers and listeners, don't go anywhere.
million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse. KUNX DB. BX. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. I want to thank all of you for listening to The X. But did you know you can watch live streaming video and catch your favorite video casts on the UnX Network YouTube channel? Wow, you mean I can watch The X shows anytime? That's right. Watch any show anytime, even binge watch your favorite programs. Which shows are on the UnX Network YouTube channel? You can watch Most Haunted with Dan Terry, Entity Voices, Paranormal Evidence, Paranormally Blonde, and Unexplained Phenomena Australia, and many more. Also, be sure and catch live coverage of special events and special broadcasts from the UnX Network. That's great. I'm going to subscribe to the UnX Network channel right now. Awesome. You can find everything you need to know about the YouTube channel at unxnetwork.com. That's unxnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything unexplained. It's the new mainstream. It's the UnX Network. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800 7 Five three eight five three four. That's eight hundred seven five three eight five three four. Or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. show not too long ago which was titled are we being deceived by the paranormal phenomena with barry fitzgerald what are your current thoughts on that episode for someone that has covered the topic for almost 20 years what do you think about that question 
Well, I do think whether you're talking about what we traditionally think of as the paranormal ghosts and those kind of things, or if you're talking about things like UFOs, I think there's a trickster element. Does that mean that I think everything that is paranormal or potentially paranormal is evil? I don't. In other words, I do think there's room for things, and I'm not sure that Barry would agree with this. I think there's room for things like angels. I think there's room for visitations from past loved ones and signs. And I don't think all the paranormal is bad per se. I'm not saying that's what he's saying, but I'm just saying I just want to be clear. But I do think there's a sinister piece to the supernatural. And again, I include UFOs in that that there is a trickster element. And I constantly ask my guests about that. Do you believe there's a trickster element? Because I certainly do. Um, another recent episode was with Colin Kelleher, who had done uh, books with George Knapp about Skinwalker Ranch and research that had been done. And they talked about what they called the hitchhiker effect. People who were doing high-level UFO research would then have other supernatural activity happen to them or it would happen to their family. You know, someone would be researching uh, UFOs with this uh, quasi-governmental group and then their family would see some kind of weird cryptid at their house. I believe George Knapp even and, and Kelly Hare both uh, have, have had experiences. That tells me there's some tricksterism going on. Uh, when you think about something like the jinn, you know, that's a, that's a topic that terrifies me. Um, a story that happened to me in regard to the jinn, and again, I don't know that there's any connection, but it was an interesting coincidence. I interviewed the great LaRose Mary Ellen Guiley um, on the topic of the jinn. Uh, later that evening, I found out my uncle died. Within two weeks, my mom died. Now... <laughs> I'm not saying they necessarily died because I did a show on the gin. Uh, if I thought that was the case 100%, I probably wouldn't be talking about it right now. But it did give me pause, so much so that Rosemary always sent me her books. And I've kept every single one, except for one. And that's the book on the gin. I didn't want it anywhere near me. I threw it in the garbage. I didn't want to settle this. And I'm not saying that it's an evil book or anything like that, but I just didn't want to tempt fate. That was a little too close to home. My my uncle had been ill. We knew he wasn't in great shape, but when they called and said he died, they could have knocked me over with a feather. That was the same uncle I told you about in the cruise story. My mom, that was totally out of the blue and within two weeks of each other. So I'm like, eh, this is a little too close for me. A little too close for comfort. So... Do I think there's a sinister aspect to all of this? In some cases. Do I think there's tricksterism? In some cases. Not necessarily all, but uh, it does give, uh, does give you pause. What you just said kind of reminds me of when Native Americans talk about the skinwalker. Really, they avoid it with all, with all of their might because they believe that they will attract it if they mention it. And kind of like what you said, talking about the gin, you had a few instances that kind of took you aback. So, and then you also mentioned Skinwalker Ranch as well. Do you, in your opinion, doing this for almost two decades again, do you feel like talking about these different things attract these types of entities or is that bogus altogether, in your opinion? I wouldn't say it's bogus altogether. Uh, I, what is this John Keel's quote? You notice them and they notice that you notice them. Um, I think there's something to that. Uh, and I also think, you know, just speaking psychologically, when you constantly talk about this stuff, you become more open to it. Now, I am not a psychic. Uh, I joke that I'm about as psychic as a board. <laughs> I have no gifts. You know, that's one of the things that I really am very careful about. I'm nobody's guru. I don't have the answers. I have opinions. I don't have the answers. You know, I've had people email me and say, well, how do I get rid of this spirit and so forth? And I said, I'm sorry, with all due respect, beats me. You know, I don't know. Here's maybe some people you can follow up with, that kind of thing. But um, I don't have any answers. 
But I do think that when you look into this stuff again, and I don't know, when you look into the abyss, it looks back. Uh, there's a lot of kind of cliched sayings, but I think they're sometimes cliches are true. I think that when you look into this, they know or whatever it is knows you're looking into it. And, and they say, aha, I see you. I see you. I see you, Christina. So then what are your thoughts on Ouija boards? Do you think they are good as a means of paranormal communication? I mean, they're sold in mainstream bookstores as games and even like new age stores and crystal shops. Or should they be avoided because they can be inviting unwanted visitors or tenants? Well, as with most things, I'm of a couple different minds on this. And I've interviewed people who say that it's evil. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. I've interviewed people who I respect, like Karen Dahlman, who say, hey, it's just another tool if you treat it with respect. Here's kind of the way I look at it for me, and I can only speak for myself. Now, a chainsaw, right? Christina, have you ever seen those people who can make beautiful wood sculptures or ice sculptures with chainsaws? You know what I'm talking about, right? I do, and it's amazing. Right, it is amazing. Okay, I take that same chainsaw I'm likely to cut my hand off. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is this, is that I think that it could theoretically be a useful tool, but you got to know what you're doing. We actually have a, we have a Ouija board in the house. I have not taken the step of getting rid of it. My wife had it when uh, she was a teenager and we kept it just kind of like a kitsch collectible thing. But we don't use it. And I'm, you know, I've been tempted a few times. Should I get this thing down and use it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell anybody not to use the Ouija board. I just treat it with caution because it seems to me like it's kind of like, I believe that it can open something up and it can attract things and you don't know what you're attracting. Now, I've had people say they got great messages for the Ouija board affirming messages from loved ones. Uh, then on the other hand, I had one person who said that uh, they saw a Ouija board walk across the floor, the board like an inchworm. And, uh, and uh, you know, one where the planchette was going in a figure eight very, very quickly and making marks, making an indentation in a figure eight on the board. It was going so fast. So... I'm leery of them. I'm leery of them. I wouldn't say definitely don't use them. I'm just saying be careful out there. If I were to see a Ouija board move like an inchworm, <laughs> I would burn it so fast. Well, that was the thing was this was a story from a campfire years ago, and I don't have it 100% uh, of recollection, but it wouldn't burn. They tried to burn it, and it wouldn't burn, and then um, they, they eventually, I think they were eventually able to burn it, I think, um, they put the, the, the planchette in a, a cloth bag, velvet bag and burned it. And then the board burned or something like that. But it's kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> a little leery there. A little leery. Oh my goodness. No, <laughs> no, thank you. I am going to pass on that specific one. Also makes me question, what about the factories that make them? Are, are the factories haunted? I don't know. It's just like something but that I comes think, to mind. I, I think what the practitioners would tell you is that it's just kind of a tool. That it's not the board itself. Some Maybe, I guess, in some cases, if it's been cursed or something. But many times, it's the person who's doing the communication is just going through the board. I think I've, I've heard that said before, that the board is the instrument. But sure. regardless, that chainsaw is an instrument too, but I'm very, very leery of them. I actually have a chainsaw, but I, I only use it on very rare occasions when I have Oof. no other choice. I guess at the end of the day, it's all about intention. No matter what you're doing or what yeah. you're touching, at the end of the day, it is intention, which leads into this is what can you tell us about objects that can be haunted? I mean, we hear stories about haunted dolls, sometimes haunted paintings, or even objects that just kind of have like this weird kind of heavy feeling to them. Yes. 
So what do you know of possessed objects from your research? Is it merely intention or something else? You know, this is one I believe in. Um, I think it can be something good. For example, I have a pocket knife that belonged to my grandfather who died many, many decades ago. But when I pick up that pocket knife, I kind of feel him. Now, that might be just psychological or there might be something to it. Um, but over the years, and I've interviewed John Zaffis, the haunted collector, a number of times and other people uh, on this topic, I think there is something to this. You know, I used to love to go thrifting and buy like old radios and gadgets and stuff. And now I'm a little more careful about that, not just because my wife says, enough clutter, Jim, enough clutter. But um, not only that, but you wonder if you might bring something home. I think about a story we had on the campfire about a painting that uh, was a painting of a, a woman, a sad looking woman. And a uh, young man called in the show and talked about this happened to his family when he was a little kid. And his mom was divorced and lived with uh, a friend, another woman, and their kids. So everybody lived in the same apartment together. And they went to this sale in this kind of, I don't know how to describe it. It was kind of a house that had all kind of like these strange symbolism and things in it and paintings, kind of sinister looking. And they bought this painting that had this woman on it. And they put the painting on the wall and it would fall down. And they'd hang it back up and they'd change the way they have it so it wouldn't fall down. And it'd fall back down. And then they would start going to bed at night and the pipes would start rattling. It started that for several days. And then they started hearing somebody whimpering. And like almost crying. And that built up in severity over a number of days. Till one day, this boy, I guess he shared a room with the other kids. It felt like the whole house was shaking. There was somebody wailing and crying. And the two moms got together and said, we got to get out of here with the kids. So they go down the stairs. They go into the parking lot. And in the parking lot, you can see back into the apartment because there was a patio door. In the patio, looking through the patio door, they're in the, they're getting ready to get in the car. They look through, there's a woman sitting in a rocking chair crying and wailing. And it's the same woman who's pictured in that painting. And um, we have a lot of painting stories, obviously, on the show. But did that painting possess some kind of uh, energy? I don't know. We had another one where a young lady had a little ceramic flamenco dancer, a woman, and uh, by her bed. And... Uh, Every night she would go to bed. She would wake up and see this figure staring at her. And it would get closer to her and closer to her at the foot of her bed. And one night or one morning, she thought her mom was coming to the door and it even sounded like her mom. And that dancer came to the foot of the bed and kind of confronted her. So when she told her family about it, they said, don't worry, we'll throw it away. Didn't stop. She tells them, you've got to stop this. I mean, we've got to get somebody in here. And they said, we didn't really throw it away. We just threw it outside. So they actually threw away and it stopped. Turned out that the person who made this ceramic was in prison for some kind of crimes against children or something. So I guess the point is, is that I believe objects have energy and that energy can be good or it can be bad. So I believe haunted objects are a thing and we hear it all the time on the campfire. The first story that you mentioned about the um, painting and the wailing woman, the first thing that came to mind was the animated movie called Monster House. Have you ever seen that movie? I have not. Well, it's really good. It's like a good kid's scary thriller. But pretty much what that story entailed was a woman actually died in the house and the house kind of became haunted. It became a part of her. Uh, it's again, it's it's. It's pretty good and it's for kids. So, <laughs> but I, when you're dealing with haunted objects or I guess 
objects with this intense type of energy, it's kind of bewildering how it works. And especially with the second story that you mentioned that the person that created this ceramic flamingo dancer was still alive and in prison. So it just kind of makes you question how is this all happening? And I would love for there to be more scientific research on this and for it to be public to, to kind of get a better understanding of what the heck is going, going on. on. There's, there's so much that is happening that we're just not aware of or that we just can't see right here, right now. So shifting gears a little bit. Last year, you did an episode on President Dwight D. Eisenhower and his alleged interaction with aliens. Real or not, this is one of my favorite UFO-related stories. For those that are not familiar with this, can you walk us through the alleged accounts with the 34th president? Yeah, my recollection is, and it's been a while since we did this show, that basically there was a cover story that uh, Ike was on vacation or something when he actually went and sat down and made a deal with the aliens. Now, I would think that's kind of, you know, on the face of it, I think that seems kind of silly. But let me, uh, and that's pretty much what was what was alleged, is that there was a cover story that he was going, I think, on vacation to Palm Springs or something like this. And forgive me if the details are wrong. This is off the top of my head. Recalling this, it's been a while. But that he sat down and they basically did a deal and, and said, you know, we will cooperate with you and do technology exchange and, and so forth and so on. I would think that seems kind of silly, except for this, Christina. And this amazes me when I think about it. When I was a kid, now I'll, I'll put my age out there. I'll be courageous. I'm 52, which, you know, will make me ancient in the eyes of... <laughs> some of your viewership, but it's not, you know, it's not that ancient. But I remember when I was a kid in the seventies, growing up a little kid, we had one phone in the house and it was a black phone. You probably saw them on TV that sat in your kitchen. It had a dial and actually people could use it for a murder weapon. It was so heavy. Now I have one of these guys, the latest iPhone, and it is a worldwide communicator. I can ostensibly reach out to anybody via video, audio, or text in the world and communicate with them. I can look up the information of the universe on it. I can play games on it. I can create content on it. It is a miracle machine. And we went from that black telephone on the wall to this in about 35 years, 40 years. How does that happen? Yes, mankind accelerates. But the rate of technological acceleration in the last 70 years, I'd say, post-World War II, which roughly equates to the beginning of the UFO age with uh, Kenneth Arnold and Roswell, it's really interesting how all that kind of maps together and how the vacuum tube uh, became the transistor and became the microchip. And, and now, you know, the, the Apple has their Apple Silicon uh, system on a chip that, that, you know, would have taken rooms of technology back in the 50s, and they still couldn't have done it. So I guess my point is, is that man is smart, but are we that smart? Or have we had a little bit of help? So is the President Eisenhower story totally unbelievable. I don't know. I don't know if it is totally unbelievable. I uh, had the opportunity before he passed to interview Jesse Marcel Jr., who was the son of Jesse Marcel, the first military officer on the scene of the Roswell crash. Um, Jesse Marcel Jr. went on to serve in a couple different branches of the military. He was a military doctor, very well thought of. And, and he had even said that he had been told and, and kind of revealed to him that there was a shadow government and a lot of different things. Now, again, I don't want to get too far out there, and I'm not saying that that's accurate, but he seemed like a very credible guy. So is it possible that Eisenhower met with aliens and there was some kind of technology exchange? I think it's possible. Uh, I'm not saying it happened, but I wouldn't 
necessarily write it off, especially with the extreme acceleration in technology that we've seen over the last few decades. At the end of the day, it just makes you have more questions. And that's one reason to why I just I find the story so fascinating. Again, real or not, just the fact that a United States president could have had a meeting with aliens. I mean, what a story. And as the saying goes, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. But uh, when I look at this story, it just sounds way too bizarre to be real. But I think at the same time, a great bedtime story for kids. (laughs) Indeed, especially if they're interested in geopolitics and aliens. (laughs) Which is pretty rare amongst the little ones. But in time. But I was a weird kid. (laughs) <laughs> it's okay. Me too. Jim, I have one final question for you. And that is, do you think there is a convergence between the paranormal and the UFO phenomenon? And if so, why? Well, I think we're starting to see more of that, honestly. Uh, you know, I remember interviewing people like Brad Steiger, the great uh, paranormal author who passed a few years ago. And I'd ask him about that. And he's saying, yeah, I've saw more of a convergence in, in recent years. And I think a lot of people are starting to think about the Skinwalker Ranch stuff. Again, people are doing work on UFOs and then they're experiencing other categories of supernatural activity, ghosts or cryptid creatures. Then we get back into the, the trickster element. Is that there? So I think there could be a connection. You look at the work of Stan Gordon in Pennsylvania saying, you know, UFO sightings also match up to Bigfoot sightings of all things. And of all the paranormal things, I'm a little more skeptical on Bigfoot than most, honestly. But I I think there may be some cross-pollination. Does that mean that every ghost is related to a UFO and vice versa? I don't necessarily think so. But there could be some things, and some of it, again, could be a trickster element. Let's say that then I would just talk to Ryan Sprague about this on this week's episode of the Paranormal Podcast. What if um, there's a, a race of super intelligent aliens who can communicate telepathically? And we already know from accounts that people have reported ET speaking to them telepathically. Well, if they can read our minds, they know our greatest fears. Is this some sort of, uh, Ryan used the phrase, defense mechanism? Could this be a defense mechanism? If somebody's getting too close to the truth, I'm going to project something fearsome to them, something frightening to them to throw them off the path. So, yeah, I think there could be a connection. Is it organic and real or is it staged? I don't know. It's really hard to say unless you have had your own experience. For example, last week I had Chase Kletsky on and when she encountered what she believes to be an extraterrestrial, she had this huge sense of fear that could have been projected from this entity to her, kind of like what you said. So when we're dealing with this phenomenon, maybe, maybe, just maybe they could just be Um, misrepresented with all these different labels, really confusing the public. But at the end of the day, maybe there's a convergence or maybe they're just the exact same, again, just with different titles. Jim, this has been such a blast. Thank you so much for being on the show. Where can people find you online to stay up to date with your shows? Well, you can find Jim Harold's Campfire, the Paranormal Podcast, Unpleasant Dreams, all three of those podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this program. And as well, you can find everything at jimherald.com. That's jimherald.com. And Christina, thank you so much for having me on your program. Uh, I really love to see um, young people coming to the fore and doing great work. And you're certainly one of those people. So I salute everything that you're doing with shifting the paradigm. Thank you so much. Well, as for many of us, we are standing on the shoulders of giants and pioneers just like yourself. So it's been such an honor and a pleasure. And I want to say thank you once again. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Jim is such a fascinating guest and his stories kept me on the edge of my seat. Each 
one of his accounts were not only entertaining, but they also addressed my curiosity. Needless to say, there's so much strangeness happening in this world and beyond that we really know nothing about. So his analogy of looking through a keyhole and seeing a library on the other side really resonated with me because it really does seem like that with the paranormal and the UFO phenomenon. We don't know much. We can assume, we can run some tests, but we can't capture, or in this analogy, open the door and pick up the book. We just won't know the content of the book by merely looking at it from afar. I would like to mention that my new show, Strange Paradigms, will be airing every Friday at 3 p.m. PST, where I cover paranormal and mysterious news items of the week. So make sure to check that out and ring the bell for notifications. Also, take a look at my website at strangeparadigms.com, where you can catch all of the show archives, guest appearances, social media links, and more. You can find Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and everything else in between. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interests. Subscribe if you haven't already, because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Thank you.